Okay. Let's ask you about your final story. Yes? Something you need? More speaking, please. Yes? What's on your mind? You're traveling minstrel? Any more tales? I love stories. Tell me about the Darkspawn. Chantry Law says it is man's pride that created the Darkspawn. In ages past, the mages of the Tevinder Imperium ruled much of the world we know. And their pride? They thought their magics invincible and imagined that they were greater than the Maker himself. So thinking, they invaded his golden city, planning to take it for themselves and depose their own creator. But they were impure and full of sin. And it is with the sin that they tainted the golden city, corrupting it forever. The Maker cursed them and cast them from his sight. Wherever they went, they spread the taint of their sin. Any land that was touched by the taint became blighted and would suffer no life. Instead, the darkspawn arose to torment us and remind us of our hubris. Okay. There's another story I wanted to hear about. Which one? Do you know anything, anything about the Dalish? I have heard a little about how the elves gained their freedom from the Tevinter Imperium. When Andraste began her exalted march against the Imperium, the elves joined her cause to fight their masters. The great elven leader, Shatan, born in captivity, rose up to lead his people. He foresaw a future where the elves were free. Shatan was killed when Andraste was betrayed, but the elves continued to fight, eventually breaking free of the Imperium. The elves claimed the dales in the south and settled there in a land of their own. Apparently it didn't last. The elves lived in the dales for centuries. They resurrected the worship of the elven gods and would allow the building of no chantry. This angered the chantry, and the hostility between the two factions finally broke out in open war. The chantry says the elves struck first, but I do not know whether to believe it. The chantry declared a wholly exalted march against the elves, named for Andraste's similar march against the winter. During the exalted march of the Dales, the elven cities were sacked, and the elven state completely dissolved. Some of the elves bitterly accepted their fates, and surrendered to human rule, living in the human cities as second-class citizens. But others, still fiercely proud of their heritage, refused to bow to the humans, and instead became homeless wanderers. There were the elves of the Dales, the Dalish. Okay, what do you know about Andraste? Andraste was the Maker's chosen. The Maker had long since abandoned the world when the sound of her singing turned his ear. Beauty, grace, and wisdom enraptured him, and he offered to take her from this flawed world to become his divine bride. But Andraste had an earthly husband and would not forsake him. Instead, she beseeched the Maker to return to his people once more. So earnest was her plea that the Maker was moved and promised that he would create a paradise on earth if all abandoned their false gods and turned once more to him. And this is why Andraste began her exalted march on the idolaters of the Tevinter Imperium. The Maker granted her his powers with which to smite her enemies. Andraste brought the Imperium to its knees and her victories converted many to the worship of the Maker. Okay. How did she die, though? Alas, it was the frailties of men that betrayed and killed Andraste. Her earthly husband, Maferath, a chieftain of the Alamari tribes himself, grew jealous as his wife's popularity and influence overshadowed his own. She was also revered as the Maker's betrothed, and Maferath began to see their own bond waning in significance as Andraste became ever more devoted to the Maker. Out of envy and spite, Maferath made a pact with the Archon Hesarian of Tevinter, allowing his beloved Andraste to be ambushed and captured. Andraste was burned at the stake in Minrathus, the capital of Tevinter. But Tevinter there doesn't have a chantry. The Tevinter chantry claims that in Andraste's last moments, Hesarian's heart softened and he heard the voice of the Maker telling him to end her suffering. He plunged his sword into her heart, and as her blood washed over his hands, he became one of the faithful. 
Dissenters said that the Archon only converted because he could not stem the tide of Andraste's cult, and was forced to do so to stay in power. We will never know for sure. Okay. I guess that's enough of that. One last thing I want to ask you before I eh, go on. Yes? Something you need? Sorry if I'm talking to you too much, yes? but... What's on your mind? I heard in Orlais, minstrels are often spies. Where did you hear this? I read it in a history book. And did you not think that this could be historic? Not all minstrels Oops. are spies. Most are just singers and storytellers. But some of them are... are what we call bards. I thought minstrels were bards. Many use the two words minstrel and bard interchangeably, but to do so in Orlais would cause misunderstanding. Bards are minstrels and more. Spies, as you say. Some say there is a bard order, but I don't think this is true. Many bards work alone or in small groups, doing the bidding of a patron who pays for their services. If there is an organization behind it all, no one knows who they are. Okay. What kind of patron? Nobles, mostly. In Orlais, there is much rivalry amongst the highborn. They fight over land, influence, and the favor of the empress. But they cannot do this openly because it is impolite. And in public, they wear smiling faces and pretend to be civil. In secret, they plot and scheme to destroy each other. It is a game completely meaningless to anyone but its players. Hmm. Huh. You were a bard, weren't you? I have revealed too much, it seems. But it doesn't matter what I used to be. It is the past. Hmm. I won't lie. It does seem interesting. So that's where you learned to fight like My that. My skills served me well. But the day finally came when I decided to just put them aside. I found myself in Ferelden and sheltered from bad weather in the Chantry. And when the storm passed, I just did not want to leave. I like to see the maker brought me here. Okay. I spoke enough, Leona. Okay, now I think I'll speak to Sten now. I didn't get a good opportunity to talk to him back in town. Why are we stopping? Honestly, since we're working together, I'd like to get to know you. There are dark spawn to be fought. Is this delay needful? I need to know if I can trust you at my back. I am Kunari. I have given my word to aid you. We are not people of idle promises. I've never seen in your people before. Can you tell me about them? No. No? Why not? People are not simple. They cannot be summarized for easy reference in the manner of the elves are a lithe, pointy-eared people who excel at poverty. Okay. Are you alright? You were in that cage for a few weeks. You are concerned. No need. I am fit enough to fight. You said you were in the army. I am. Have you ever fought in a war? I have always fought in war, human. So you must know your way around the battlefield, then. Some of them. They aren't all alike. Why? Are you always this bad at answering questions? Generally. I do not see how this matters. Seheron and Parvolan are distant. Ferelden and the Darkspawn are immediate. What's your hair? What a strange you? language you speak. You say hurry, where I would say duty. It's not your duty to handle the blight, no, though. No, it is yours, and you are chatting with me instead. I should get As moving. Okay. It's gonna be hard to become friends with that guy. Okay. My friendship with some of these guys is definitely going to need to be improved. Okay, next up, let's speak with Morrigan. Maybe she'll be a little more friendly. What do you wish of me? I was wondering if we could talk. If you must. So you grew up in the Kokori Wilds? Why do you ask me such questions? I do not probe you for pointless information, do I? Honestly, well, you can probe me any time. pardon, then, while I jump for joy. What is it you asked if I grew up in the wilds? A curious question. Where else would you picture me? For many years it was simply Flemeth and I. 
The wilds and its creatures were more real to me than Flemeth's tales of the world of man. In time, I grew curious. I left the wilds to explore what lay beyond, never for long. Brief forays into a civilized wilderness. Hmm. And yet, you remained unnoticed. For the most part, Flemeth taught me well. For all that I had been taught, however, the truth of the civilized lands proved to be overwhelming. I was unfamiliar with so much. So confident and bold was I, yet there was much that Flemeth could never have prepared me for. Very daring. Sounds just like you. <laughs> Equal parts daring and foolhardy, perhaps. Only once was I accused of being a witch of the wilds, and that by a chastened who happened to be traveling with a merchant caravan. He pointed and gasped and began shouting in his strange language, and most assumed he was casting some curse upon me. I acted the terrified girl, and naturally, he was arrested. I have to admit, that was actually pretty good thinking. Men are always willing to believe two things about a woman. One, that she is weak, and two, that she finds him attractive. I played the weakling and battered my eyelashes at the captain of the guard. <laughs> Child's play. The point being that I was able to move through human lands fairly easily. Whatever humans think a witch of the wild looks like, tis not I. Not that I did not have trouble. There are things about human society which have always puzzled me, such as the touching. Why all the touching for a simple greeting? You mean like a handshake? To begin with, yes. What is the point of touching my hand? I find it an offensive intrusion. There were many nuances that Flemeth could never tell me of. When to look into another's eyes. How to eat at a table. How to bargain without offending. None of these things I knew. I still do not understand it all, truth be told. But then I gave up long ago any hope of doing so. When I returned to the wilds last, I swore to Flemeth that I had no intention of leaving again. Hmm. Honestly, some of that could be talk. Old. Well, I'm glad it worked out this way. Yes? Let's ignore the entire Darkspawn threat and the presence of a simpleton as your only other Grey Warden ally, then. Not that I lack appreciation for the intent of your comment. Thank you. Well, let's get on with it before the ground opens up and swallows us, yes? <laughs> I won't lie, you are still just too fun. Definitely gonna have to find some gifts, gifts for you guys. Yes? Hmm, I'd like if to ask you, you another something. Have you ever been hunted by the Chantry? <laughs> you are very cute to ask so many questions. And you are very cute when you're evasive. Really? Perhaps we should be wrapped in ribbons and adorned with flowers. So cute are we too. <laughs> My mother has been hunted from time to time, yes. By Templar fools like Alistair, which should tell you how successful they generally were. Hmm. Flemeth made a bit of a game of it, in fact. The Templars would come again, and she would look at me and smile and say that the fun was to begin once more. I feel sorry for the Templars. They came with as much swagger and arrogance as they did self-righteousness. Pity them if you wish, for they held none for us. Flemeth would warn them once. It was a warning they inevitably failed to heed. And then the true game began. Often Flemeth would use me as bait. <laughs> a little girl to scream and run and lure the Templars deeper into the wilds and to their doom. Surely more would have followed. Sometimes. Eventually. Thankfully, the wilds is a vast place. Once they found us, Flemeth would simply move us elsewhere and we would be lost within the forest once again. I did not understand the danger we faced until I was much older. I had never heard of apostates or maleficarum. Uh, I'm not sure what the second one means. What exactly is an apostate? I've never got the exact definition. Ugh, definition. You do not know. The zealots use that word for any magic they do not control. 
The Chantry sees any mages not leashed to the Circle of Magi as apostates, and apostates could become Maleficarum, evil mages that resort to blood magic and become demon-enslaved abominations. It may even be true. Still, those of us who prefer freedom see no reason to submit. Hmm. I won't lie. I agree with you completely. Oh? I hope you're not simply being agreeable. It would be a refreshing change. Enough of this talk. Let us return to the task at hand. Let's speak a little more. Yes? Well, I'd like to ask you a little more. If you must. Is Flemeth really what she appears to be? <laughs> well, that depends, does it not? What does she seem to be? Human? No. She just feel... I guess... Human, I guess, would be the right word. Oh, she certainly was human. Once. Tell me, how much do you know of the tale? The one that the Chastened still tell of my mother, to frighten them into obedience. I literally just heard about it. Honestly, I'm more interested in the truth, Uth, and I know you can give it to me. I can relay what Flemeth once told me herself, and you can decide whether or not tis the truth, if you desire. It sounds interesting. Why not? As the tale is sung by the bards. There was a time when Flemeth was young and beautiful. A fair lass in a land of barbarian men. The desire of any who saw her. Okay, I've heard this part. The tales say that Flemeth fell in love with Osin the Bard and fled the castle of her husband, the dread Lord Conobar, and that he swore vengeance for her infidelity. In truth. My mother claims that t'was Osen who was her husband, and Conobar the jealous lord who looked on from afar. Lord Conobar approached young Osen and offered him wealth and power in exchange for his lovely wife. And Osen agreed. Okay. He sold his wife to another man? Okay, I want to kill him. The life of a bard is a poor one, and love fades in the wake of hunger. It was Flemeth who suggested the arrangement. All would have been well had Lord Conobar kept his end of the bargain. But he was a foul man who bargained with coin he did not possess. Osen was led off to a field and slain, left for dead. Flemeth spoke to the spirits and learned of the deed, and swore revenge. Okay. So she truly cared for Orson? That was not the point. Conobar had no honor, so she would not have him. Flemeth begged the spirits to aid her, and twas they who slew Conobar. The demon the legend tells of came later. Lord Conobar's allies chased Flemeth, you see. Chased her to the wilds, and there she hid. There she found the demon, and he made her strong. The legends all speak of the great hero Cormac, he who defeated Flemeth and her great army when she invaded the lowlands centuries later. All lies. Which she never invaded or he never defeated her. The truth of the matter is that there was never an invasion. As Flemeth tells it, the Chastened never raised an army under her banner and she never fought with any warrior named Cormac. Cormac led a brutal civil war against his own people, and later claimed it was to vanquish evil that had taken root amongst the lords. Thus, he was hailed a hero. Flemeth was only attached to the legend much later. Perhaps it was due to the great war with the Chastened that eventually came, but Mother claims not to know how it began. That's actually interesting. But I gotta admit... How has she been alive that long? I do not believe everything that Flemeth claims. Oft it seems her bitterness has colored her memories. But on the whole, yes, I believe this tale, if not all. The legend says that Flemeth had a lot more daughters. The demon within her has transformed her into something else. 
An abomination, perhaps, some would say? I know not. I only know my mother is clever, and she is part of the wilds as it is part of her. But she is no immortal. She bleeds. A blade in her heart would kill her like any other, were it lucky enough to find her. Hmm. Oh, wait, I guess I said something different. The legends that Flemeth that they talk about Flemeth says she has many daughters. You ask if I have sisters? I have asked of this myself. The stories tell of many witches of the wilds, after all, not just the one. And these tales existed long before I did. Flemeth refuses to speak of other daughters, if they existed. So, should I believe I am her first? I doubt that too. Why would she refuse to talk of them? The Chastened tell of a falling out between Flemeth and her daughters. They say that one day she hunted them all through the wilds and ate their hearts. Mm. It may be true. I have never seen another witch or heard of one. Perhaps one day Flemeth will eat my heart as well. Aren't abominations usually insane horrors? How often is this usually? Always? If not always, then when is it not true? There are more things in this world and the next than you or I could ever hope to understand. What Flemeth became is a mystery. I suspect even to her. And it, I won't lie, it's an interesting story. So, and thank you. Flemeth tells it with far more embellishment than I, but you are welcome. Dare I ask of your own mother? Few are abominations of legend, tis true, but I find myself curious nevertheless. Sure. My mother died recently, in fact. Ah, then you have my sympathies for what it is worth. Which is very little, I am certain. It matters not. Let us move on. Thank you. It means more than you think. Let's see. Yes? So, uh, I won't lie, I think I've asked you everything in this. If you must. Whoops. Yes? Life in the walls must have been pretty lonely. At times, perhaps. A world full of people and buildings and things was all very foreign to me. If I wished companionship, I ran with the wolves and flew with the birds. If I spoke, it was to the trees. I won't lie. That sort of sounds nice, though, I won't lie. For a time. But one can only remain a child for so long. I recall the first time I crept beyond the edge of the wilds. I did so in animal form, remaining in the shadows and watching these strange townsfolk from afar. I happened upon a noblewoman by her carriage, adorned in sparkling garments the likes of which I had never before seen. I was dazzled. This, to me, seemed what true wealth and beauty must be. I snuck up behind her and stole a hand mirror from the carriage. It was encrusted in gold and crystalline gemstones, and I hugged it to my chest with delight as I sped back to the wilds. What happened then? Flemeth was furious with me. I was a child and had not yet come into my full power, and I had risked discovery for the sake of a pretty bauble. To teach me a lesson, Flemeth took the mirror and smashed it upon the ground. I was heartbroken. But you were just a child. And a foolish one. Flemeth was right to break me uh. of my fascination. Beauty and love are fleeting and have no meaning. Survival has meaning. Power has meaning. Without those lessons, I would not be here today, as difficult as they might have been. I won't lie. You don't need to live that way any longer. No, that's not true. They made you stronger, didn't they? They did indeed. To return to your original question, perhaps my time in the wilds was indeed lonely. But such was how it had to be. I find myself at times wondering what might have become of the girl with the beautiful golden mirror. But such fantasies have no place amidst reality. New ability. Mirror? Okay. Mages. Heroic accomplishments. 
Oh, okay. Spells and talents. Anything involving a mirror. She learned something about a mirror, and I'm curious what it was. Here it is. Minor magic. Inspired by your leadership, this party member has gained a minor bonus to magic. Party approval. Generally like you and respect your leadership. There'll be much more money to open up to you when you don't worry about death around every corner. And you'll need to talk to them more often if you want to continue your relationship. You can track party members' approval by looking at that. Hmm. Why not? She's open to pass. Yes. Let's see. So, Any more in regular? Full of questions, are you? <laughs> Tell me, are you really her daughter? I assume you were actually asking whether Flemeth herself gave birth to me. Truly, I do not know. I once asked Flemeth that very question, and she merely laughed at me. It is not inconceivable that she could capture a chastened man. Or perhaps change to a more attractive form to attract him willingly. I find it more difficult to imagine her with child. She could have. St I won't lie. She was not always as old as she is now, was she? As a matter of fact, I remember her being younger once. She had black hair, much like my own, long and lustrous. But how could that be if she is centuries old? Has she become wizened only recently? Or are the tales of her legend only that, and nothing more? I do know the tales of Flemeth having many daughters, even though I have never met another. And Flemeth has always treated me as her blood. What? Under her, though. But she doesn't seem to treat... She doesn't exactly, uh... Seem very motherly. Must one be a doting and simpering moron to be considered a suitable mother? No. Flemeth taught me everything I needed to learn. How to survive, the meaning of power, the truth of men. If other mothers do not teach these things, then I believe them the lesser. Okay, see where you get it from. I guess in a way you are true. You suppose it's true? Is true. Take yourself. You do not honestly desire such things from me, do you? Tis better to be free of such cloying and cluttering delusions as love. Why limit yourself? I do not consider it a limitation. Not leaping into a burning building also happens to be an experience best avoided. I tire of this discussion. Let us move on, shall we? Okay. I want to ask her you a few more questions. Yes. At least ask something a little more personal. We're in camp, so tis as good a time as any. No. Not the right time. I'm an idiot. <laughs> I should have just gone with the kissing her. Oh well. Let's at least see how good a mood she is in with me. Interested. That's a good sign. Maybe another night. <laughs>